It's a joy to be with you today. I want to read from 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse number 8. 2 Kings verses, chapter 4, verses 8, 9, and 10, and use this as a foundation from which to just see what the Lord would minister to us today. 2 Kings 4 and 8 says this, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, everybody say passed by. As he passed by, he turned in thither at their house to eat bread. She said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which, oh, there's that phrase again, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. And let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be when he passes by. Oh, no. No, the, 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 the verbiage changes now. It shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. Something changes in her relationship with this one. See, Elisha's name means God is my salvation. And, and something shifts in her relationship with God is my salvation from him passing by to him coming to her. And the thing that made that difference was they built a chamber on the wall. So I'm going to preach to you a little bit of today about building a chamber on your wall. And you can be seated if you'll smile. All grumps should be recognized as such. Praise God. I'm going to give you good news today. And uh, if, if, if you can't say amen to this, we're in trouble before the day's done. Here's good news for you. If you want to, you can live for God, and there's nothing hell can do about it. That's good news. I'm telling you, I don't care what hell dreams up. I don't care what your enemies here on earth say. I don't care how people make fun of you. I don't care who doesn't like it. If you decide that you want to live to God for God, there's nothing crafted in hell or on this earth that can stop you from living for God if you want to. You want to. Now that has a converse bad news attached to it. That if you don't want to, there's no program this church can craft. I don't care how gifted your pastor is, and I think he's amazing. I don't care how many people want you to. If you don't want to, nobody can make you. It comes down to desire. It comes down to what burns in your belly. Do you want to live for God? The level of communion you have with God is solely based on how bad you want to. We're, we're here at the first of the year, pretty close to it. I've got good news for you. When this time next year rolls around, the depth of your prayer life is up to you. I got bad news for you. The depth of your prayer life is up to you. It's all, it's all, however close you want to be to God, by the time this year ends, that's how close you're going to be to God. And if you want to, can't nothing stop you. If you don't want to, can't nothing make you. That's just the way it is. Desire is a powerful element when it comes to living for God. It is a prerequisite to many things. Proverbs 18 and 1 says, Through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. The Bible uses the analogy of a, of a little newborn baby and his, his earnest and, and, and passionate desire for milk when it says in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes, we should desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Luke 22 and 15 expresses the Lord's desire when he looked at his disciples and said, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I find it amazing that Jesus looked at his disciples and said, I want to spend time with you. Can I tell you today, it strikes me that it is highly likely that God has greater desire to be with us than we even have to be with him. 
However much you may like coming to church, and I hope you do because this is a great church, but however much you get excited, it's Sunday. I, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. I think God even more so starts looking at his watch as 9 o'clock in Atlanta starts rolling around and then 11.30, and he says, it's almost time. I get to be with my people. I get to commune with them. I get to bless them. I get to receive their worship. He has desire for us. It was his desire for a church that held him on the cross. It was for the joy set before him that he hung there. He wanted this day. He wanted to be with us. Uh, and so I have preached numerous times in my life about the desire. Old, wonderful, dear old brother Alan Oggs wrote that book, You Gotta Have the Want To. Talked about desire. I've come to understand as years have rolled by that desire alone does not produce results. It is only when desire meets actions that results come. I'm, I'm, I can't even believe I'm going to ask this right now. How many of y'all are hungry right now? There are three honest people in this whole house. I don't believe that. Thank you. Thank you. It's all right. And, I, and, you know, the unenviable position, I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch. That's not a good place to be. You walk out of here, your belly can be growling, sound like an African pride of lions. You go out and sit in your car, and you and your spouse start fussing about where you're going to go eat. You ever had those discussions? Well, we went there last week. Well, how about there? Oh, they got waits too long. I can't. My wife and I had one of those one time. We sat down. I'd been gone. It's youth division days. I'd been gone for about a week, and... We sat down in the car, and that particular day, both of our kids got invitations to go hang out with their friends, so it's just her and me. We don't have to worry about what place has kids' meals. And so I said, baby, it's just you and me, and I don't have to preach tonight. I just, where do you want to go? I'll take you any place in the city of St. Louis. Where do you want to go? She said, I, I, I don't care. I said, no, no, you have to care. This is my chance. <laughs> Tell me, anybody, you name it, I'll tell you. Scott, I don't care. I said, oh, you have to care, please. She said, I've been making decisions all week while you've been gone. I don't care. Just go. I said, you don't care. I don't care. All right. Every man in this house knows what happened next. <laughs> I drove, turned the turn signal on, started pulling. She said, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go here. <laughs> I said, I am 100% certain that I heard you say repeatedly under intense questioning I'd have waterboarded her if I could have got the truth out of her at that moment. I said, you just, you told me you don't care where we go. And she said something to me that every woman in this house will understand. She said, I don't care where we go. I just care where we don't go. <laughs> got it. Could you provide me the acceptable list? And then I will pick from among the choices. I just. You can have one of those conversations and tell your own funny story to a congregation someday. Sit out there in your car, hungry, hungry, starve to death if you never drive to a restaurant. Because all your desire does not nourish your body. It's only when you put action to that desire and pay the price necessary that you're going to get the nourishment you need. Can I tell you today as a fear of God, you can say all your life, I want Jesus, I desire Jesus, but until you start putting some action to it and start doing something about making that desire turn into reality, you'll be at the same place spiritually next year as you are this year and the next year after that because at some point you got to shake yourself and say it's not enough to be a church member. It's not enough to just come here and worship. I've got to do something about getting close to God. So I've been sent by the Holy Ghost today to challenge you about getting close to him, pursuing him, seeking him, fashioning, framing in your life a structure so that you can be closer to God than you are right now. You're going to have to build a chamber on your wall. Elisha, who is again, I reiterate, whose name means God is my salvation, passed by the city of Shunem one day. There was in that city, the Bible says, a great woman. That has nothing to do with her girth. 
Even the Bible doesn't address that. She was a great woman. She was important. She was probably a woman of some means. It is likely she had significant wealth. She served on the Beautify the Shunem City Park Committee. Every week in the society column of the Shunem Gazette, you could find her name. She was important. She mattered. Every dignitary that came to town met her. Everybody of significance that came through would stop by her house and seek an invitation to dine with her, to visit with her, because she was just that important. But the Bible says that when God is my salvation was passing by her house, this lady who had all the comforts of life went running down the sidewalk, got down on her knees and grabbed him around his ankles and the Bible says she constrained him to come into her house to have bread with her. She didn't just invite him. She didn't just say if you'd like to. She got a hold of him and said I want to get one thing very clear. If you're going in any house in Shunem you're coming in my house. If you're going to spend time with anybody it's going to be with me. I'm not going to sit inside and think that you owe me a visit. I'm going to come out and get a hold of you and get you wish we had that kind of passion that said God doesn't owe me anything but I'm going to go get a hold of him come on Atlanta West you need to walk in this place on Sunday and say God if you're going to bless any church you're blessing my church if you're going to move in any row you're moving in this row if you're going to bless any family you're blessing my family but I'm going to get a hold of you and bring you in this house I hate to bust your bubble, but it ain't the praise team's obligation to get him here. Ain't your pastor's job to preach pretty enough that God is my salvation shows up. It's your job to get hungry, to get a hold of him and say, you're coming in this house. She humbled herself. Her neighbors might have made fun of her. Why do you worship like that? Because I want God. Why do you get out in the aisle and act like that? Because I'm hungry after God. You don't want him in your house? That's your business. But I'm going to get a I'm going to get a hold of him and I'm going to bring him in my house. And so, and so the Bible records that as oft as he passed by, he would go into her house and break bread with her. It became a practice. It became a habit. It became the common practice. He would come by, stop by. And she'd set out a coffee cake and a pot of coffee. Unless you're like me and don't like coffee, please, please still be my friend. Then it's a pitcher of cold milk to go with the coffee cake. So whichever you like is just fine with me. I don't care if you want Dr. Pepper with your coffee cake, whatever. <laughs> the Holy Ghost just fell on that boy right there. <laughs> whatever it was, they... She'd set that thing out. And listen, listen, now, now follow me. I'm out. You have to engage your brain in this message. It became the pattern of her week that every Sunday at 1130, God is my salvation would stop by and they'd have coffee cake together. And every Wednesday at 730, he would stop by and they'd have fellowship together. And it was a wonderful time. I mean, it was spectacular. She loved being with him. The coffee cake was good. The praise team was awesome. The preaching and teaching was stellar. It was a great appointment on her calendar. She loved what it represented. For hours after the, the dinner, she'd be plucking crumbs off her lapel, and enjoying the remnants of the overflow of what she experienced at those times when he passed by. But at some point, she got frustrated because she began to notice a pattern that when the last of the coffee cake had been served and the last cup of coffee had been consumed, God is my salvation would look around the parameters of her home structure and say, I don't really see any place for me to stay. And the joy of his arrival was swallowed up in the grief of his departure. And the anticipation of what was to come was swallowed by the 
unsettledness of the fact that there was no place for him to stay. And so she would watch him come up the sidewalk with great anticipation. And she would walk him, watch him walk down the sidewalk with great regrets. And so she went to her husband and said, something has to change this year. You hearing me? She said, something has to change. I am no longer satisfied with coffee cake visits. I want an abiding visitation. When I get up on Monday, I want him still in this house. When I go to bed on Tuesday, I want him still in this house. I don't want to wait till the next time he passes by. I want him to come to us. And I want him to set up residence here inside our family. She said, honey, you don't understand. I can't stand it anymore. I'm tired of occasional visits. He comes and he goes. I want more than an experience. I want a relationship. I thank God for the profound experiences you have here. There's nothing like being in an apostolic service. So thank God for the profound God moments. Thank God for the Holy Ghost coffee cake we enjoy. I love it just like you love it. But she said, at some point, honey, I can't live like this any longer. I'm not satisfied with that. I want something more. And being the sensitive, understanding husband like we all are, understanding every nuance of our wife's slightest expressed wish, Pray for her, that lady right over there. Pray for that one right there. He said, well, okay, baby, I get that. Tell you what I'll do. I'll run down to the Shunem Walmart. Every town has one. And I'll, go and I'll, I'll buy one of those inflatable air mattresses that you hook up to the vacuum and blow it up. So we'll bring that here to the house. And tell you what, I think as I look around her, I think probably we could scoot the couch down that way a little bit and we could crowd the entertainment center over that way a little bit. It might be a little crowded, but I think we could fit God in. We, we could push our career down that way a little bit and crowd, the, crowd our entertainment over that way a little bit and push our hobbies over that way a little bit. And it might make our schedule a little full, but I think we could fit him in. I see that lady look at her husband and say, you don't understand what I'm saying. This is God is my salvation. He doesn't deserve to just be wedged in between the other things we think are important. He doesn't deserve to just be fitted in to our calendar somewhere. He's a lot more than just something to check off on our to-do list. This is God is my salvation. In him we live and move and have our being. I'm not satisfied to just fit him in. Well, okay, all right, I get it, I get it. Thankfully, Walmart's got a really good return policy. I'll take the air mattress back, baby, I'm sorry. That was kind of a boneheaded idea on my part, I'm sorry. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take the credit they give me for taking it back, and I'll buy one of those 9 by 12 sheds. And I'll go back on the back side of the property and set that up for him. And you're right, baby, it won't be for anybody else. It won't be crowded. We won't put the lawnmower in there. We won't put the old golf clubs in there. It'll be his and his alone. 11.30 to 1.30 on Sundays, his and his alone. 7.30 to 9 on Wednesday night, his and his alone. We won't clutter it with other stuff. This is his. And baby, now that I think about it, it's a great idea. We'll put him out there. Because if he was right here in our house, we'd have to watch how we talk. <laughs> if God is our salvation was living right here with us, we'd have to be careful what we watched on Netflix. <laughs> Unless you're a pilot for Southwest Airlines, I'm not scared of you right now, okay? If we had God and our salvation right here in our house, we'd have to monitor our relationships. We'd have to monitor our appearance. We'd have to monitor our activities. But I tell you what we'll do. We'll put God as our salvation back in that shed, and we'll lock it from the outside. And that way we'll always know where to find him when we need something. 
Every time one of the kids is sick, we'll go out there and knock on the door like rubbing the magic lamp for a genie and we'll give him our list of needs and God as our salvation will be conveniently located without being underfoot. Great idea, honey. I like it. His wife said, I don't know what's wrong with you. But you still don't understand. He is way too important to be segmented in a little compartment on the backside of my life. He's way too important to lock up in a box and view him like some kind of divine Santa Claus that I only bother when I want something. I'm not looking to put him in a box back there somewhere. He will not be relegated to the backyard of our family. Well then, like all sensitive, understanding husbands, he probably said something along the lines of, well, for pity's sake, woman, what do you want? She said, I want you to build him a chamber on the wall. Now what's interesting to me about that is she did not say, I want you to build him a chamber on the south wall. She didn't say, I want you to build him a chamber on the northeast corner of the wall. She just said, I want it on the wall. No specifications. Here's what that tells me. Honey, we're going to build him something. It will be his alone, but here's the thing. It's going to be higher than everything else in our family. And it's going to be on all sides. Because whichever way I look, I want to see God as my salvation. If I'm looking that way, I want to look up and see him. If I turn this way, I want to look up and see him. Are you hearing me? When I'm on my job, I want God as my salvation to be what I see. When I'm driving down the road, I want to look up and see God as my salvation. I want him all around me. I want him surrounding our family on all sides. But higher than everything else we have. And I know you say, but preacher, I have the Holy Ghost. Yes, I know. Thank God. That's God in you. I'm talking about a relationship where you're in him. Where your life is so immersed in him that no matter where you are or what you're doing, that's what you see. My grandfather, his name was Paul Klepper. That's a good Irish name, not German to the core. In fact, last time I was here, I think I told you about his conversion when my, my grandma had an earache and they went to a conference. And Anyway, never mind. My grandpa Klepper, when I was about 12 years old, 13, and I knew everything. Remember that? When you knew everything? I miss those days. I was about 12, 13, I knew everything. And my grandfather had an annoying habit. You would be talking to him about anything. Say, whoo, it's hot out today, Grandpa. He'd say, it certainly is. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Traffic is horrible today. It's miserable. Hallelujah. Since I knew everything, I wanted to explain a verse to him about not using vain repetitions. Because he wasn't even thinking about it. I've seen him do it sound asleep. Oh, Yes. Kick back in that lazy, that, that leather lazy boy he had in his living room, and he'd be asleep and snoring. I'm talking about Olympic level snoring, okay? I mean, letting her fly. And then he'd hit one of those snorts that wakes you up. Do I have to demonstrate? You know, he just, and all of a sudden, he'd, hallelujah. I wanted to explain to him, you're not even thinking about it. You're just muttering words. They don't mean anything because I knew everything. See, here was the problem. I was still enjoying the crumbs of youth camp coffee cake. And he was living inside Jesus. So it didn't matter what direction he looked, Jesus was there. It didn't matter what he saw, Jesus was there. He could say hallelujah no matter what he was looking at. I was feeling so proud of my coffee cake experience. And he had a chamber relationship. I'm pleading with the Atlanta West. You're a wonderful church, but God help us to get beyond the coffee cake of good church and get into that place where Jesus is on all sides of us. And no matter what you're doing and where you're looking and what you're thinking, Jesus is there. But 
sweetheart, I understand now what you want, but baby, have you priced lumber lately? I'm not suggesting it'll be cheap. I'm not suggesting it won't cost us something. This kind of chamber always costs. Well, yeah, but it's easier for you to say you're not the one up there pounding your thumb with hammers and getting splinters. Honey, I know our flesh won't like it. Flesh is always made uncomfortable when you start building a chamber. But I can't live like this anymore. I'm not satisfied like this anymore. Oh, but sweetheart, look up and down the street. Nobody else has that. Think of the people we go to the synagogue with. I mean, they're worshipers. They don't have one. I can't speak for them. Maybe they are satisfied with coffee cake on Sunday and Wednesday. But I want something more. I just hope there's some people here today that want something more. But if you want it, you're going to have to do something about it. God's not just going to come through and say, oh, you want it? We're here. Poof, you're a spiritual giant. You're going to have to take some steps. You're going to have to do practical things to build framework for him in your home. Yeah. Build him a chamber. Put it on the wall. Surround your life with him on all sides, but higher than everything else you have. Because, see, I think the value of this chamber probably arises perhaps primarily from what happens there. After this guy had finished framing it, building it, drywall, paint, he had put in the carpet, installed all the baseboard, got all the doors hung, plumbed, square, framework, everything's all done. I mean, he has, he has putted up the holes, touched up the paint. It is done. He walks downstairs, puts his ladder in the garage, hangs his tool belt up, exhausted, weary, tired, broke. He walks to the house says, all right, baby cakes, finished. And she said to him some of the scariest words a man could hear. Let's go to the furniture store. Because it's what they put in that place that I think may make it really significant. Consider with me that he, she said, first of all, I'll tell you what we're putting in there. We're putting in a bed and a table. This is not a place to sleep in a nightstand. It's not what this refers to in Eastern culture. They dined reclining on beds. They would lay down to eat, feet away from the table, head and shoulders toward the table and eat. This is why Jesus, think about it, I know what, I know what the Da Vinci's photo looks like. It's not accurate. It's why Jesus was able to come up behind them and wash their feet when they were at the Last Supper. Because they're laying there with their feet away from the table. That's how they, that's how they dined. He is, she is saying, we're going to make this a place of nourishment. I'm going to propose to you a theory, a, a nutritional plan. Tell me what you think about this. Tell me if you think this would make you strong, healthy. Here, here's the plan. I'll come up here to these teenage boys who are, I guess, teenagers. I suppose you are. Maybe just past that. I don't know. But I'm suspecting all of you can eat. Yeah. yeah. I told my son, how, anybody, any, any of you about 16? Anybody? No? Yeah. My son was 16. I told him, I said, if you ever go missing, the only way I can describe you to the police is what your rear end looks like sticking out of my refrigerator. That's all I see anymore. It's just all I've got. <laughs> yes, number three, the Frigidaire. That's him right there. Just... He had a tan from the light bulb in that thing. It just... So... so here's the nutritional plan I'm offering, okay? 9 o'clock or 1130, take your pick, on Sunday morning. There is a buffet. <laughs> Breakfast buffet. I'm talking about everything you could conceivably want that goes in a breakfast buffet. Eggs to order, omelets, bacon, sausage, ham, biscuits. Let's pause a moment, shall we? Bis gravy, pancakes, I mean, crepes, French toast, warm syrup. Somebody corrected me in the first service. You can, praise the Lord. Uh, I'm, I'm tough, fruit, if you want it. Uh, frosted flakes, fruit loops. I'm talking to the young men. I mean, just... Everything you want, juices, milk, coffee, everything. And it's awesome. It's all you want. You can't eat till you can't waddle to your car. Put a buck in the plate. It's awesome. Now, here's the problem. You don't get to eat Monday, and you don't get to eat Tuesday, and you don't get to eat Wednesday. But don't be scared. Wednesday night, 730, another buffet. Steaks cooked to order, fried chicken, pork chops, barbecue, 
chow mein, whatever it is you like. I don't care, man. I mean, it, tamales, whatever. I'm, all ethnicities of food. I don't care. Whatever, I mean, and, it, and it's all you want. Dude, load up. The man can cook. Here's the problem. You don't get to eat Thursday. You don't get to eat Friday. You don't get to eat Saturday. Sunday's coming. Anybody think you'd be very healthy with that kind of diet plan? You think maybe you'd have strong days and weak days? There'd be days you'd be susceptible to an enemy on that program? Don't you think maybe your enemy would be more scared if he knew you were getting a little sustenance in between the buffets? Then you tell me why hell is going to be scared of us if the only nourishment we're getting is what the master chef is putting out on the buffet on Sunday and Wednesday. I'm telling you, if you want to grow in God, you got to build something in your life where you're getting some nourishment on your own on Tuesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, Friday midday. Come on, somebody. She said this chamber is going to be a place where there's food. My youth ministry days come back to me. We wonder why we have kids that struggle with their flesh when they're out on dates on Saturday night. They haven't eaten since Wednesday. How are they supposed to be strong? How are you supposed to be strong to withstand the enemy if your only nourishment is what you get here? I am not minimizing this. This is vital, but this can't be all. She said, I'm going to build something in my house so that when I get up on Tuesday morning, I spend a little time with him and I find strength for my soul. And when I get ready to go to bed on Thursday evening, I spend a little time with him and I find strength for my soul. She said, that's not all. We're going to put a stool there. That's not a thing to sit on. It's certainly not a commode. It's a stool. The actual word is throne. I know. It's my dad calls it too. No, I'm not talking about that. She said this. There's going to be a throne in this place. Because this, oh, this is going to be a place where we worship. No, not just praise when the music's playing. But worship and reverence. Before him. And we don't ask for anything. I'm not talking about bringing a laundry list to him of stuff we want him to do. I'm talking about getting down and being satisfied that if you don't ever give me anything else, I'm just glad to be here with you. You want to plot your spiritual progress? I can give you a little quick barometer. Luke chapter 15, that prodigal ran down the hog lot and came back. He prayed two prayers in that chapter. Each of them is two words long. One of them he prays as he's drifting away from his father. One of them he prays as he's coming back. The prayer he prays when he's leaving, give me. Give me that portion of goods that falls to me. The prayer he prays when he's coming back, make me. Make me as one of thy hired servants. You can pretty much gauge your spiritual temperature. Are your prayers populated with give me or make me? I'm asking somebody to make a transition this year and learn how to just get in his presence and not just present him a list of things you want the divine Santa Claus to leave under your tree that week, but say, God, I'm so hungry for you. I just want to spend time with you. I just want to worship you. There's a throne there. There's a throne and please understand, he wants us to cast our cares on him. He wants you to make your requests known to him. That's perfectly, absolutely scriptural. He delights in giving us good things. That's all right. But my walk with him better be more than like he's Amazon. And he delivers goods to my door at my beck and call. Because if that's my measure of what I have in God, what happens the first time he says no? Pastor mentioned that I served at one point as the youth president for the organization. During my time at the youth division, I was sent by the then youth president, Brian Kinsey, to Texas 
to attend their district conference to rah rah sheesh for Christ, what has now moved the mission. Thank you for being a just the, the, the flagship church in our fellowship for, for move the mission. I honor you highly. We go down there and they told me, you know, it's at their campground and they said, you'll have a seat up on the platform. Just come up and find your chair, name card in it. So I walk up there and I find my chair and I just kind of, you know, you're curious, who am I sitting by? Now these name, names may not mean something to all of you, but I look over in the chair beside me on one side, it says James Kilgore. If you don't know Brother Kilgore, he's just, just an icon. He's got stories about crawling up in the attic of his church and praying for three days at a time without coming down, sleeping in chicken coops while they're evangelizing. His dad, C.P. Kilgore, started 500 churches in Texas or something like that. And I'm seated next to him, so I... I'm going to look over to the other side. Man, I hope it's somebody carnal on the other side. <laughs> I look over. O.R. Foss. If you don't know who O.R. Foss was, the old elder is gone now, but he could preach conviction. Dear Father in heaven, he could, he could preach conviction. You'd repent of stuff you never even did. <laughs> Unbelievable. His daddy, O.F. Foss, started the other 500 churches in Texas. I'm in between those two guys. And I'm just like, I told him, I said, I feel like, I felt like that little, that little paper they give you back when you were in elementary school with a roll of pictures and you had to circle the one that didn't fit. Oh, no, don't feel bad. I'm just, it's, it's true. You know, they, they, there'd be an apple and a banana and a grape and a Buick. It wasn't too complicated to figure out which one didn't fit in that roll of pictures, you know, I'm sitting there looking at them. I'm like, well, I'm the GM product right here, obviously. Well, the false preached that night. He tore my guts loose. I'm talking about, I mean, I know we talk about, boy, that preacher stepped on my toes. No, he broke my knees. He crushed my, I mean, he just beat me to a bloody pulp. I'm bleeding and crying, laying there, squalling on that metal folding chair. I think I rusted the bottom out with the salt water running down my face. I mean, it was just, it was ugly. He came back and sat down in his chair his knees were bad. He came back and sat down and I could get some composure. I looked up and I said, Brother Foss, I said, your generation has something that my generation doesn't have. And I know it's not the Holy Ghost. I got the same Holy Ghost you've got. And I know it can't experience, there's no short cover experience. I get that. But what is it, Elder? What is it you've gotten a hold of that I'm afraid I don't have yet? And he looked at me and said, oh, I can answer that. I said, please, please, Elder, tell me. He said, your generation loves the presence of the Lord. He said, my generation loves the presence of the Lord. He said, it's all a matter of how you spell it. He said, your generation loves the P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, -E -E the presents, the gifts, the Christmas presents. You love it every time God gives you a new car or a new house or a new thing or a new suit or a new position or new whatever. You love it when God blesses you and gives you presents. He said, we were sleeping in chicken coops. We had people throwing tomatoes at us, but somewhere along the line, we fell in love with the presence of the Lord. And I'm saying, oh God, baptize your church in 2023 with an unbelievable love for the presence of the Lord if I don't get any other blessings if I don't get anything else I want to go in that chamber and kneel down in the presence of the Lord I think we ought to talk to him just a minute right now before I even finish I wish you'd just reach to him just a minute and say God baptize me with a love for your presence What would happen to this church if everybody in it was more in love with his presence than we were with coffee cakes? What would transform in our services if we came in already having been in his presence? She said, we're going to put a bed and a table there. We're going to put a throne there. And then she said, we're going to put a candlestick there. This may be the element that makes this most frightening to us. Because a candlestick in the scripture, a candle, is always emblematic of the Lord searching us. Remember that lady in Luke 15 lost that coin in her house? She lit a candle. 
to search in the corners to find it. Proverbs says, the spirit of the man is the candle of the Lord, searching the inward parts of the belly. Here's why that chamber is a little frightening. In that chamber, it's not about who you think I am. It's who God knows I am. In that chamber, it's not my actions that you can see. It's my attitudes that he shines his light on. It's my motives that he makes clear. And he makes me confront ugly truths about myself. Can I just tell you as friendly as I know how? I would rather confront them now than on that day. Here, here's the challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm just about done. A million years ago, I went to kindergarten. Right after the dinosaurs died. I remember one day in kindergarten, Miss Lee, old spinster, or little spinster, never been married, sweet lady, Miss, Miss, Miss Lee, our kindergarten teacher. She, um, she introduced a guest to us. This lady was a dental hygienist. And she was there that day to teach us how to brush our teeth. Now, she broke out a toothbrush about six feet tall. It was, I mean, big old thing. And a set of teeth commensurate with it. I mean, she had this set of teeth and that teeth was just... They were, they, were, they were impressive. Jimmy Carter would have been proud. It was. And she showed us how to take that toothbrush, you know, on, on the surface, how to brush, how to brush along the gum line, you know, all that stuff. She got done. They handed each of us our individual, personal, cellophane wrap, never before used, little individual cheap toothbrush and a little thing of toothpaste. And then she said, okay, class, I want you all to go down to the bathroom. I want you to brush your teeth. These same children had to be beaten the night before by their parents to get them to go brush their teeth. But on this day, oh, I mean, we tore out of that kindergarten room, heading down the bathroom like a, like a troop of chimpanzees. Just rah, down the hall. And we're crowding around. We're elbowing each other at the sink, trying to get her. It's like a water hole in the Serengeti. We're trying to fight for our spot. And brush our teeth. Brush. I mean, there's foam just rolling out and scrub the enamel off, you know. Everybody, that is, except one young man. I will not call his name. He might be here today. He might watch it. But we'll just, we'll call him Bob. And if your name is Bob, that is no reflection on you. Bob, this was about his fourth trip through kindergarten, you know. One of the few among us who could drive himself to school at that point. Uh, <laughs> he'd seen all this before. He wasn't impressed. He just stand over on the side with his toothbrush in his pocket. We're like, hey, hey, Bob, you gonna brush your teeth? Nah. Seen it before. You sure? Now, he, he was wise to how this all works, or at least up to this point, because when we got all done, he took his toothbrush off, walked over, swizzled it under the water in case Miss Lee checked it. He wanted it wet, you know. We all go trooping back down in the room. Teacher said, now, class, we have something for you. And she pulls out. Now, you have to be my age to understand this. She pulls out this little baggie. Has these little red pills in them. Uh-huh. Apparently, this was a new development since Bob attended kindergarten last. See, you'd take one of those things, put them in your mouth. They taste okay. You chew it up, and they'd kind of fizz and bubble in your mouth. But they were chemically designed to stick to your teeth any place that wasn't clean. So, you know, you'd, if you missed a little spot back here, it'd leave a little red stripe back here, you know. So she lines us all up there in the front of the class. She says, all right, everybody. Smile. All oh, let's get you. All except Bob. Bob's down on the end going. Oh, Bob, smile bigger. Bob, smile with your mouth open. Bob, 
Show us your teeth. And it looked like somebody had taken a chainsaw and run it around the inside of his mouth. It is blood red. Every speck just across everywhere. Miss Lee made a startling observation. She said, Bob, you didn't brush your teeth, did you? Oh, Miss Lee, you saw me. I went down there with everybody else. Yeah, I know, but you didn't brush your teeth, did you? Had my toothbrush just like the rest of them. I, I know. But you, didn't, you didn't brush your teeth, did you? Miss Lee, I felt what they felt. Yeah, but you didn't, you didn't brush your teeth, did you? Oh, Miss Lee, I went down to the altar with the rest of them. Yeah, but, but you, didn't, you didn't clean up that attitude, did you? Oh, come on, I carried my Bible, King James no less. Yeah, but you didn't, you didn't clean up your thought life. Oh, come on, God, I, I felt what the rest of them felt. But in the chamber, in the chamber, shows me what I am. A bed, a table, a stool, and a candlestick. 